Hello and welcome to the New World Review, your source for everything anime and manga. Today I'd like to have a brief discussion about the recently completed The Rising of the Shield Hero. Now take note that this is not a review or a why you should watch, I might make a separate video for something like that, but instead this is more of a somewhat coherent, probably not, rambling of my thoughts on the series. As a result there will be spoilers, lots of spoilers, oh so many spoilers. So if you haven't seen Shield Hero and you plan to, I highly recommend coming back to this once you've had the pleasure of doing so. On the other hand, if you haven't seen it and you're still here for whatever reason, then well, good, good for you, pleasure to have you. And regardless, we're going to get straight into it now. First of all, just some basics. Shield Hero is another in a long running line of isekai, a genre that can be extremely hit and miss, and as a result, it can sometimes be a detractor to sell a show as an isekai to me anyway. But I believe that Shield Hero quite firmly evolves and elevates the genre from most of its competitors. It's a fantastic step in the right direction, but it also does most certainly have its flaws. And I'd have to say that as a result, my overall feelings on the show are a bit mixed, because there is quite a lot about this series and this world that I am very much in love with, but also a lot that really takes me out of it, and we'll go through the good and the bad, but I like to start out positively, and there's no better place to do that than right at the beginning. Shield Hero had me completely hooked from episode one. I really enjoyed the premise of a basic isekai setup, only to have our protagonist now Fumi betrayed so thoroughly, and immediately set up on a completely different path to anything that we, or at the very least I know. And it managed to achieve that by providing the character of mine. And you know, I don't think I've ever come to despise anyone so powerfully in such a short amount of time. And that is absolutely brilliant, because it forms a strong emotional bond between Naofumi and the audience. We are bound together by our pure rage for this character, and I was so immediately compelled to devour the rest of the series and watch Naofumi hopefully take revenge. It was one of those rare situations where I found my feelings very much in sync with the protagonist. Most of the time when Naofumi was angry, I was also furious, be it at mine or the king or whatever, but my direct feelings were being conveyed by Naofumi on screen, and I think that's a pretty powerful experience, definitely not something to be underestimated. So immediately Shield Hero succeeded where many other isekai fail, by providing a main character I actually care about, as opposed to a more or less empty vessel that I'm supposed to insert myself into and live vicariously through. I mean, Naofumi actually has a personality, and he's forced into very quickly adapting to the role of a bad guy, which I thought was a great direction to be taking him in. A proper underdog story, where we actually have the potential satisfaction of revenge, as well as the intense exploration of rage. Unfortunately though, this did not quite last. And as much as I was still on board with Naofumi for the entirety of the series, he eventually does slip into a more conventional main protagonist role, and sadly, he's not the only one that suffers with time. His counterpart heroes also began the series with exceptional potential, but really, they were all completely outclassed by Naofumi in no time at all. And I think that Momoyasu in particular was turned into just a little bit too much of a dumbass. Like, there were points later on in the series where it just became frustrating to watch him confront Naofumi over and over again, on the basis of increasingly obvious lies. And the same goes for Itsuki and Ren as well, because they're touted to be the smarter ones of the group, but it takes them entirely too long to actually suspect that Naofumi might be getting framed, especially since they uncovered Mind's underhanded tactics in episode four of the series, episode four. And there's a bunch of other stupid issues as well, like how in the first episode, they were portrayed to be analytical and intelligent enough to discover that they were all from different versions of Japan. But towards the end of the series, the four of them couldn't even figure out that they all had different ways of using their weapons in regards to the rarity or the copying power, etc. They just became a bit plain, I guess. But for the most part, I did really enjoy the dynamics and conflicts between the four heroes, plus their designs were pretty schmick and always an aesthetic treat to see on screen. While we're on characters though, this is probably a good time to talk about the whole, uh, the whole lolly thing. Shield Hero very clearly sets itself in a world of lolicon fantasy, which you know, there's just no hiding from it when all three of Naofumi's party members are prepubescent girls, even if one does grow up rather quickly. And I really don't want to go any deeper into this issue, but Shield Hero kind of forces you to, because it is apparent at all times after episode one. And this is probably the biggest attracting factor of Shield Hero for me. Having been an anime fan for far, far too long now, I've grown accustomed to the idea that series like this will probably have one lowly character, you know, just to fill whatever requirement Japan seems to have in regards to appealing to that audience. But this is probably the first show I've ever stuck with that goes so out of its way to cater to that niche. And it is a credit to the world and the story, because if either of those factors had been anything less than great, I would have dropped Shield Hero long ago. And I'm not saying that these characters had no value either. For example, Fila was great, but I found myself mostly enjoying her in her filolial form because she became powerful and funny, whereas I found her quite boring in her human form. And I know that this is probably ridiculous to say when discussing anime, but I'm about to use the R word, so beware. Look, in general, I just don't find underage girls fighting against the dark threats of the world in any way realistic. There we go, I said it. At least not in a series that's first episode had me hooked by presenting this dark and mature setting. Adding innocent-ish little girls don't really contribute to that atmosphere unless you're a tortured slave like Raftalia, or, you know, Higurashi in general. 
I guess. But as said before, I found myself willing and able to get over that because this world and many of its characters were just so compelling. I really enjoyed the concept of needing to fight off wave after wave of ever increasing danger. You know, it's that basic mechanic I feel like I've played in a billion different games, but it works so nicely. If anything, my only complaint in regards to them was that there was not enough wave action really. After each wave, I just wanted more and that is a great credit to the story and its anime adaptation. I will say that I believe the first half of the series is far superior to the second though, and it's purely through pacing. It felt like such a wild ride going through the first 12 episodes with such rapid progress, and each episode felt so jam-packed full of stuff. But things did slow down a fair bit after that, especially during the whole Pope fight, because I swear at least two whole episodes were spent with everyone literally just standing around, talking about character stuff as they stared into their very potential impending doom. But it's not just that, because I did notice that in the second half, our main characters have a tendency to get sidetracked a lot. Like if you were to map out their journey after they'd fought their second wave, now Fumi and company initially set out on a mission to upgrade their classes, which turns into a flea to another country, which gets turned into no, let's turn around and meet the queen, which gets turned into a grudge match against Raftalia's former owner, which then becomes about Philo and the Philolio queen, which then becomes reunite with the heroes and fight against the battle pope. And I really miss the direction that we'd had previously in the first half of the series, because back then when our main characters said they do something, they got it done and it felt like nice progress. Whereas the second half is just a constant barrage of being sidetracked. And yeah, all of these ever-changing goals are very important to the plot and certain characters. But after some time, I do recall saying to myself, oh my God, are they ever actually going to do something that they set out to do? But even with that said, these constant distractions are admittedly pivotal and quite enjoyable. And I particularly love the concept of the Philolio Queen, who displayed absolutely absurd power. I have never seen a bird kick that much ass before. And it makes it all the more foreboding when you realize that not even that will be enough to stop the later waves. I love that sort of thing. Until it turns out that of course the queen is also a lolly because that's just how this series works. Actually, you know what? Some great characters who aren't lolly shuffle on in at the very last second being Lark and Therese. And at that point in the series, they were a breath of fresh air that was so sorely needed because we were making no progress whatsoever with our other three heroes. So their injection of energy and antagonism was very much appreciated. They also came with the welcome revelation that the four cardinal heroes are not the only heroes in existence, which just Thank you. That decision has infinitely expanded the possibilities of the series and is one of the reasons why I am so excited for a season two, which uh, if it is coming out at all, won't be for a long while now. So I will more than likely dive into the light novels if they're readily available. But I suppose we're not done with controversial topics just yet. I came into Shield Hero about halfway through the season's run. So I feel like I missed a lot of this, but apparently the show was criticized initially for the way that it depicts slavery, as well as for the whole false rape accusation. And looking back on it, well, that certainly is one hell of a way to conduct your first episode with two incredible potentially sensitive topics. It's the sort of thing that could really tank a property if it were mishandled, but I think they make a lot of sense within the world and it does help to provide the super dark atmosphere and to levy something incredibly serious against now for me. Because I've thought about it and I'm not sure what else really could have been done apart from your stock standard murder to really turn the whole world against him. So yes, I suppose mine could have murdered someone and framed now for me for it, but I just don't think that we would have achieved the same feeling of pure rage because as a society, we're quite desensitized to death, especially in animation. And also it would have brought a third party into things rather than crafting this profoundly personal conflict between Naofumi and mine. And as for the slavery, well, there's less of a defense that I can come up with there. I mean, it's legal in the world. The slave trader is a dick and yet he appears in the opening as if he's some plucky good guy ally. But none of that really bothered me because of the path I thought that the show was going down. After the first two episodes, I thought that Naofumi was going to be forced into some really dark stuff with slavery and the concept of owning slaves being but one example. But Shield Hero doesn't stay consistent with this tone and Naofumi really falls into the role of classic hero by the end, with his only dark aspect being the raid shield. So yeah, it's a bit weird to think about, but the arc of the slave owner is he stumbles upon Naofumi, and by the end of the series, his business is better than ever, trafficking lives away for God knows what nefarious purposes. So with that in mind, I'm very much hoping that things go back to their dark roots in future arcs, because that tone was a really big part of what hooked me into the series in the first place. Speaking of arcs though, it's pretty difficult not to highlight the fact that shield hero had a very, very natural ending at episode 21. Like it legitimately felt like the series was over, only for me to discover that that there would be another four episodes. And it's really weird because they do a whole heroic goodbye and embark onto the next adventure. And then in the very next episode, they've been called back and are chatting with everyone that they said goodbye to. However, I am glad that the series didn't end at episode 21 because the next four episodes were very much needed in my eyes. And episode 25 in particular gave us a much more well-rounded ending that really brought everything the series had been working for up until that point together. So what else can I say? In the end, Shield Hero was a super solid series. I actually fear that these thoughts may come across as a bit overly negative, but that's because I have a habit of getting hypercritical when I find a story with some incredible potential. And it's because I want it to be that perfect existence. But even with everything I consider a flaw, Shield Hero has accomplished something pretty incredible with this 25 episode run. And I cannot help but just immediately 
want more. But that pretty much does it for my final thoughts on the rising of the shield hero. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produced in general, then please do consider donating to the New World Review Patreon because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. And if Patreon isn't quite your style, then please do leave this video a like, share or subscribe because it also helps support this channel an incredible amount. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server where a wide array of shenaniganry takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your own thoughts on the rising of the shield hero. This has been the New World Review, and I'll see you next time.